this is Orta X, an independent study I've been doing with Dave Beach. I studied here at Stanford undergrad in um, Earth Science and the Earth Systems program. Took some time off and then came back here for a master's degree in mechanical engineering and I'm now finishing that up. And we don't have a, a master's thesis for that program, but that's kind of how I'm thinking of this project. Um, it feels like a culmination for me of a lot of my undergraduate stuff with Earth Science active interests in material science and, and craft and, and the engineering kind of all coming together. So thank you all for coming. I'm really glad to be sharing with you. So this X was once sand, uh, was once mountains, and was once the hearts of stars. And I want to tell you that story. I made it because it's a tool, a really fundamental one. Craig Milroy lent me a book called How to Start with a Tree and an Axe and Build Your House and Everything in It. I just thought that was so cool and I thought naturally, well, I guess I have to make an axe. And then if you're gonna make an axe, you better make the steel, I guess. So that's sort of what got me here. Um, I think tools are important because they really do help us do what, what humans do. And that's the same thing that life is, that we create and, and life is a creation and it, it's order put into the universe. And that's an important thing to me. Tools feel like an expression of life. We all know about entropy and the, the second law of thermodynamics. And entropy is always increasing. Everything is always moving towards disorder. And I want to do a thing. Um, I'm going to have everyone close your eyes right now. And imagine that you're on the edge of a river and this is the Entropy River, and it's starting up high in the mountains and flowing all the way down into the ocean, and it's going to flow. The water is going to go downhill no matter what. It's just the way things are, but if you, you're sitting on the side of the river now, and if you reach your hand in, into the water, and, and see what the water does, and you see it swirl around, and it's kind of coming around the backside of your hand and, and making a little spiral, an eddy, and it's this temporary backward turning, just for a time, where it's staying there, staying there, staying there. And then soon it will continue on. It'll be swept down river. But for a bit, there was this eddy. And so you can open your eyes. Uh, that idea of an eddy is going to be important throughout the presentation. And they're everywhere, so I want you to keep an eye out for them. So I'm making this, this axe from scratch in this project. And I imagine sitting in the cabin I made from the trees I cut down with the ax, and maybe I'm eating an apple pie and I grew the apples or something. This, the, this vision is something that's really, really cool to me. And it, it's something about connecting to the, the objects around me, knowing their stories, how everything fits together. That, that's really satisfying. So I'm, I'm eating this apple pie. And then some of you might know that Carl Sagan once said, if you wish to make an apple pie, you must first invent the universe and all the galaxies within it. So I'm going to try to do that for you right now in the next uh, 30 minutes. And then there'll be time afterwards to ask questions and take a look at the stuff I brought. Uh, so the universe, um, there, there might be people here that know a lot more about this than I do. And there are competing theories and we're looking pretty far back and it's a very big story. I'm going to do my best to give the most accurate story I can of the big picture. So 13.7 billion years ago, something happened. And that's opposed to nothing. That was the Big Bang. And, and this is an image of the cosmic microwave background. The colors are showing very slight unevenness in temperature distribution. And those correspond to small overdensities in that initial medium that came after the Big Bang in the mass distribution of the universe. And those little overdense regions began to collapse gravitationally and, and form all the structures that we have around us now, including stars. This is our sun. Um, stars began forming something like 400 million years after the Big Bang. And those stars and structures of galaxies composed of many stars and other bodies coming together. The earliest galaxies we know of were 900 million years after the Big Bang. The Milky Way itself is 12.6 billion years old. So the, the universe 
13.7, the Milky Way where we are, 12.6. Uh, this is uh, NGC 6744, which is considered uh, to be very similar to the Milky Way. So in these stars, within these galaxies, uh, the elements are born. At the start of the universe, or shortly thereafter, the first four elements were already present, hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium. Um, and the rest were introduced via fusion reactions in, in stars. Um, and there's two main types of stars. There's the lighter types, which undergo a certain, certain death, and the, the heavier ones. And those lighter ones um, can create all the elements up to magnesium in their fusion reactions. Um, and their life cycle uh, culminates in a, a red giant, which is this massive star. And shortly after reaching that maximum size, it actually casts off its outer parts into a nebula, a planetary nebula. Um, this is the Eskimo Nebula. And that nebula kind of casts out into space, and then the core collapses into a white dwarf. Um, and that's that spot in the middle. And that white dwarf will slowly cool um, for a very long time. Uh, so that's where all the elements up to magnesium came from. Sufficiently massive stars uh, reach that red giant phase, but they're super giants. They're, they're much larger. And rather than that planetary nebula, they go into a supernova explosion. And that's sort of an initial collapse and then an explosion outwards. And this is the Crab Nebula, which corresponds to a supernova that was recorded by Chinese astronomers a thousand years ago. There was a flash of light um, that they recorded, and, it, and this is that a thousand years later, expanding <coughs> outwards. And these stars can create iron as they're going up to red giant, and then when they collapse and go supernova, that's when everything heavier than iron comes. And so this is all those elements up to iron and beyond being cast out into the universe. Generations of these stars cycle around and form molecular clouds um, and, and some of the initial elements that were cast from the Big Bang. All of this is sort of swirling around, compacting, exploding out. And we have things like this. So this is the constellation Orion, and you can see his belt right there. And this is the Orion molecular complex. And there's, there's all these structures and molecular clouds, and stars are actively being born in these areas coalescing from over dense regions of this stuff. And you get solar systems within all this. This is a protoplanetary disk 450 light years away, which is representative of what was happening when our solar system formed, our sun and our planets. And that's that uh, uh, material collapses into a disk, the center forms into a star, and then you get the planets forming at subsequent regions going outside. And so you have a, a general distribution of elements in here of the, the heavier ones inside and a lot of the lighter um, gaseous ones outside. Um, our sun was born in that way about 4.6 billion years ago, so two thirds of the way through the universe's life. And around that disk, shortly thereafter, 4.54, so only some millions of years after, the Earth was formed in that protoplanetary disk of these planetesimals and everything coalescing into Mercury and Venus and Earth and the other planets. That eventually cooled within 4.4 billion years. It was cold enough to have liquid water. And then we had all the while air, water, and rock sort of cycling in these cycles of, of the Earth. And soon we had life 3.8 billion years ago, so very early on in the Earth's um, history, we had life in its own cycles. And that brings us to something that looks like home. So here we are, there, that's like right here. And I, I want to try to somehow make that more than just abstract, but like this room that we're in and, and this earth we're standing on and these bodies that we're in all came through that, that story. And we're going to start zooming in now um, and looking at where this axe came from in the Earth. So because the Earth was closer to the sun than something like Jupiter, we got a lot of the heavier elements. So there's a lot of um, hydrogen and helium and other things in Jupiter, and there's a lot more of it. That's why Jupiter's so large. And then there's a smaller number of those heavier elements that became 
Mercury and Mars and Earth and um, we have uh, a whole lot of iron. Um, iron is the sixth most abundant element in the universe. It's 0.11%. Um, but in the Earth, it's by mass the most abundant element. And that's primarily because of this core. We have a, a solid core and a molten core. And the majority of both of those is iron. There's also some nickel, but mostly iron. Um, and, and that's just based on our, our distance from the sun. We happen to, to get that mix of elements. Um, we can see there's a mantle, uh, which is more plastic material, still hot, but not quite molten, and then a thin crust on the outside. And it's, it's that crust riding on the mantle that, that is the tectonic movements and that is the, the movement of the continents um, and, and the land we stand on. So we're gonna start zooming into California and in particular the Sierra Nevada. And the Sierra Nevada is running all the way from up here down towards Southern California along the crest east of us. Here we are in the bay. Um, and we can see there's a lot of rivers overlaid on top of that that are all emptying out into the San Francisco Bay. The Sierras were formed in something like this where we had about 100 million years ago, a subducting oceanic plate coming down, going underneath the continental crust. Um, that was the, the old North American plate. Um, it goes down deep enough and with enough heat and pressure, melts, gases rise, liquids rise, and you get a molten layer up in the continental crust. Um, you end up having these massive volumes of magma, some of which come out as volcanoes, but a lot of which stay underground and simply cool there. And that's uh, plutonic igneous rock as opposed to volcanic. And that's granite. It has such big crystals because it never exploded out. It cooled very slowly in these batholiths, what they're called, these massive uh, monolithic rocks under, under the earth, something like 60 kilometers down. So that was happening and these batholiths were forming 100 million years ago. About 10 million years ago, plate tectonics and other shifting of these plates caused a block to tilt. And then all this granite that was underneath became high up and exposed. The rivers that formed carried away the lighter um, and looser materials and exposed what we know of as the Sierras today. And so these peaks are the, the worn down cores of these uh, batholiths that were raised up and exposed. And we see in Yosemite Valley, these giant monolithic faces um, that are old magma chambers um, from 100 million years ago that were then raised above. And if we look at the granite, there's a lot of stuff in there, um, including something magnetic. And it's weakly magnetic. I don't know if it'll hold up this magnet, but almost. You can feel there's something in there. Um, this is a rock I got at the Yuba River, which is right here. Um, and in the river, you can see all these granite. This is in the foothills of Sierra. All this granite is being broken down and worn down by organisms and by the water. Um, organisms like lichen and fungi up here and then coming down. Um, it's breaking it all up. And if you go and you put a, a magnet on the beach, you'll pick up something. And you're starting to see the field lines of the magnet there. And that's magnetite. It's iron oxide, Fe3O4. Um, which is 72% iron. It's mostly iron. Um, and these are these little crystals that were just locked away in that granite in very low concentrations. Um, those crystals are freed, broken up, and cast down the river. And they go down from all the way down here and all the way up there, down the rivers from the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River into the bay through the bay and out the Golden Gate. And the, the predominant currents in the Northern Hemisphere are clockwise. And so we have a clockwise current coming south here. And there's not a lot of material that gets deposited up north, but everything coming out of the bay comes and gets cast up on Ocean Beach and everything south of here. And, and this is where my hand enters the story. So if, if you go to Ocean Beach, you can find piles of this magnetite sand sifted for you. 
and we can see that it's, it's definitely magnetic and there's got to be some iron in there. Take that ore and put it in a crucible and mix it with charcoal and little broken up sand dollars. That's the magic formula. Uh, the sand is giving us iron, the charcoal is giving us carbon, and iron plus carbon is steel. And the sand dollars are in there because they're going to help um, melt out. They flux the, the, the slag, they create a slag and they flux the um, impurities that are present in there, meaning they lower the melting temperature and help suck out all the things that you don't want into this glassy layer that forms on top. Um, and so the sand dollars also came from the beach as well as a handful of this sand and that goes on top and then a sand dollar for good luck. Um, and that's going to form a glass on the top that both keeps oxygen out and um, gives a place for the impurities to sort of float up and, and coalesce so that you just have the iron down in the bottom. We put that in a furnace heated with propane and we heated it for about an hour and a half. And this is, if you look in there glowing white, you can't see anything. Um, every once in a while you feel inside and you try to see if the core, the ore has melted yet. And once it's molten and you don't feel any, any lumps, it's ready. You take the top off and everything has sunk down and compressed. And you look in and there's a, an inner light glowing from the crucible. There's the glass on top, that slag that formed and hardened. You chip it away and something's underneath. And you get an ingot of steel. And so that was a, a pretty magical step for me. And I want to emphasize that within an hour and a half, that charcoal, sand, sand dollars turned into that. Um, and this is the piece cut in half and I etched it so you can see this amazing crystal structure. Um, Hideo um, in the back got me access to a scanning electron microscope and some optical microscopes the other day. And if you, we can zoom in on some of these, here's uh, 40 microns. So that's uh, half the diameter of a human hair, roughly. And we're starting to see these channels of ferrite, which is mostly iron, and then these perlite structures, which are uh, mixtures of iron and carbon. And that's where the carbon went. And I have a, a ton more of these images um, that we can look at afterwards if you want. There's whole worlds in there. And that bar will go all the way down to uh, some 500 nanometers, I think, are some of the images we got. It's crazy. In any case, we took our ingot. We heated it up to relieve some stress um, and soften it um, as it cooled so that we could cut it in half. and then put it in a forge, a propane forge, where we're heating it up red hot so that we can deform it plastically, smush it around like clay. That's blacksmithing. And we do that, we get it red hot, and this is in the power hammer. We're trying to create, we cut it in half so we had something flat, because it's a lot easier to work with something with at least one flat side. And we're trying to create a square-ish usable ingot that could start to resemble an ax. Um, I did this with Jeff Pringle. Um, his website is vikingswordsmith.com. Um, he's an incredible guy and he's made all these incredible swords from the steel. So he's, he's the one that taught me how to do this, make the steel and work with it. Um, it it's very different from, from modern normal steels. You have to work with it in particular ways. And one of those is that as you're forging it, you get these cracks forming. Um, there are, there's porosity in that steel. It's, it's amazingly uniform, but there is porosity. There are surface cracks that can start to propagate and you risk like the whole piece sort of crumbling apart. So you forge it and then you get cracks and then you have to grind them off um, and then continue forging. And I was just wincing every time we did this because this is like our, our steel flying off and burning into the air. Um, and we had to do that a lot. But eventually we got it down to a really nice, that's Jeff. Um, and we're doing it this at Jim Austin's shop who's a blacksmith in, um, in Oakland that um, was letting us use his tools. And we got a, an ingot. Um, and this is, here it is laid out for, for the ax. And what's going to happen is this is going to get squished out, that's going to get squished out, and that's going to be where the eye is. And then the fronts wrap around and then weld together, and that's going to be the ax. So 
here it is in the forge. Uh, we've squished out the, the lugs around the eye and started folding it together. Um, and when we're doing this, we had to move very slowly and heat it at a very low temperature um, because the, the steel is just much more fragile and, and hard to work with. And it's like very possible to completely lose it all with a stray hammer blow when it's too hot. Um, here it is welded around together. I, I didn't take pictures of the, the forge welding steps because it was kind of stressful. Um, but it's folded around and smooshed together and it's now one piece. You don't see any dark line there showing you that it's cooling uniformly. Uh, this is from a different axe that Jim was working on, um, but that's the forge welding step. And that's where you get it um, yellow hot as opposed to just an orange or red. And then if you put a flux on there, um, borax, which is going to help dissolve the, uh, uh, the oxides, you get it hot and then smash it together really quickly. When you take it out of the forge, the flux sprays off and um, the surfaces weld together and, and become one. So that's what we did. Um, but there's a problem with forge welding and crucible steel because it doesn't like to be hot. And that's that. And so that's when uh, this axe became really more uh, a hatchet. <laughs> and so this is, this is the axe um, now. And I'll, you can come up and look at it. There'll be more photos. But um, I'm going to keep calling it an axe. We kept going. Um, this was a little bit too hot, and I hit it. I was trying to spread it out, and just the whole, the whole front came off. Um, but we kept going, and this is the point when I, I started praying. Um, I'm not religious, but I was muttering. I was staring into the fire and muttering things to the gods of steel and earth, and uh, it worked out. Um, we ended up getting something that looked like this, which is uh, really all, all I could have hoped for. And, and with a, a bit of cleaning up, and um, it ended up like that. Um, so very happy with how that came out. Um, and so that, that took us like all the way back and up to today and, and up to this, this object, like, like that object right there. And you can see how it was, it was sand, how it was sand, like actual sand, this sand, and how it was mountains, like this rock, like that particular rock. And, and how all that was was the hearts of stars, and you know that that's a, a miraculous story, and I think we all know it. But I, I want to make it more concrete. And, and the chairs you're sitting on, and the, the steel legs, like that, that all has the same story. And and all the atoms in your body, um, none of it, it, it all carries a no less miraculous story. And, and this axe is an eddy. Um, this is a, a temporary backward turning. Of, of, of energy on itself. Um, and it's a tool, in fact. It's a, it's a tool, f it's an eddy for making other eddies. It's going to help me put more structure into the world. Um, and, and that's an expression of life. Just as the constant increase of entropy is the basic law of the universe, so it is the basic law of life to be ever more highly structured and to struggle against entropy. Um, and he is a, a Czech writer and, and politician. Um, I've talked about the materials. I want to talk about what animates those materials briefly. Um, and that's, that's the energy in them. And so the, the sun radiates energy. And we can think of the earth as, as reaching into that flow and, and creating eddies and redirecting that energy into its own cycles, within cycles of, of the atmosphere and the oceans and the rocks all moving. Um, and and life as well. And, and then we have the rock cycle and these plates subducting and creating igneous rock that becomes volcanic and erodes down and just cycles through. And on top of that, we have, um, or quickly to say, the, the, the energy that's sort of driving this, like that, it's from the primordial heat of the formation of the Earth as, as well as radioactive decay of elements in the Earth. And, and all of that came from and through ancient stars. Um, on top of this is the, the hydrologic cycle. And here we have water evaporating and precipitating 
and running down the mountains and eroding the Uber River and then doing it all over again and that's going much faster right on top of that other cycle. And notice the sun in the, the upper right hand corner that's also driving that process. And it's all working on rocks like this. And, and this rock is, is weakly magnetic. You can feel there's something in there and it's the most magnetic one I could find. Um, I went to the river with um, my partner Annika and, and it was an excuse to mostly go swimming and sort of feel productive too. So um, there's magnetite in here, um, but not very much. And I took a piece off and I broke it up and I separated it out. So that much was not magnetic and that much was magnetite. Um, and this was a particularly dense specimen. Um, it got very little. So we have minor yet extremely useful little tiny crystals of magnetite that are widely dispersed in these monolithic rocks 60 kilometers down, um, these batholiths. And they're uplifted for us by the action of tectonic plates um, and they're freed from their stone prisons and then washed down the river hundreds of miles where they're accumulated by the actions of waves into layers you can sink a shovel into. And it's totally amazing that I talked to Professor Gary Ernst, who's a geology professor here, and he just said, yeah, what an entropy decrease. That's, that's, a, that's an amazing sorting algorithm. You can get these tiny things. And all this work is done for us, again, by the sun. Another thing, I wanna talk about transformation of sand to steel, um, and that's that alchemical step taking something black and turning it into something heavy and shiny and metallic. Um, s axes were first made from stone and then bronze and then iron. And the lowest energy state of a rock is a rock. That's why you find them just sitting around and why people use them. Something like bronze, you need to um, smelt from its ores and its oxides to um, bring it into a higher energy state into its um, elements of copper and tin and some others. Uh, iron is even more so. We had to put a lot of energy into that furnace um, in order to, to make this iron, to coax it away from its iron oxide state. And where did that come from? You know, this thing was glowing white for an hour and a half. I want to look at that white tank over there. And that's, that's where that energy came from. That's propane. Propane is a distillate of crude oil. So you take crude oil and you put it in a big distilling tower and the lighter stuff rises up to the top and condenses there and you get stuff like lubricating oil and diesel and all that and then at the top are gas and that's um, something like propane and butane. And where did the oil come from? Small marine organisms uh, 300 to 400 million years ago in the Devonian and Silurian seas that covered the earth. Um, they gathered the Earth's energy with photosynthesis at the surface and sank to the bottom, carrying that with them, where it was deposited, eventually covered, and over millions of years became the, the fossil fuels that we're able to burn now that give us such incredible energy. Um, this is an acrotarch. Acrotarch. And this is an actual phytoplankton from 400 million years ago in the Silurian seas, or Devonian. And it's an organic walled fossil, meaning it's not mineralized. It's, it's, it's a lot like it was when it died 400 million years ago. And we're able to find deposits of these things and take microscope images of them. Um, this was one of the, the main types of phytoplankton back then. And this is really small. It's, um, you know, that's 20, uh, human hair is about 100 microns. And that's, that's a 20. So, um, I, I looked into how many of these would need to, to come from, um, to make five gallons of propane. And um, it's a lot of back of the envelope stuff, but I found some papers that helped me out. And it's something like a million pounds of those. And I'm not sure if that's wet or dry biomass, but one way to think about that is that a million pounds of krill is what a blue whale we eats in a year. So I, I expended a, a year's worth of blue whale life um, bringing this steel into being. Um, 
And, and when you think about it, this propane, like what was I doing? I was, I was burning buried sunlight in a very literal sense. And you know, I'm wearing a, a mask because we all know it's, it's not good to look directly at the sun. Um, so I don't want to get too Carl Sagan-y here, but I'll do it anyway. And, and, and that, that's because I think it's, it's true and it's real and it's, it's awe-inspiring for me. Um, and I think it bears repeating the idea that you know, everything around us, this ax, um, the elements in it, and the energy that brought it into being are, are all from the sun. Um, and, and past suns, and, and the same goes for, for everything, including our own bodies. Um, and that's just a, a miraculous story that we all know and we've all heard, but uh, it bears repeating and, and trying to, to feel concrete. Um, so knowing that, we might think, what is the fate of our sun? What's going to happen? The, the sun is one of those lighter stars that's not going to make a supernova, but it's going to create um, a, a red giant and then go into a planetary nebula and that's um, 7.6 billion years from now um, so it's uh, 4 billion almost 5 billion years old now so it's, two th it's a third of the way through its life roughly um, the surface of the earth will be too hot for liquid water in something like uh, 3.75 billion years um, and then beyond planetary engineering or whatever might happen, when the Earth expands to its red giant phase, you can see how much larger it gets. It's going to extend 20% past the current distance between the Earth and the Sun, which means unless we move the Earth or something, uh, we're going to get completely swallowed up by the Sun. Um, 120 million years later, it's going to uh, cast off into a planetary nebula and then shrink into a white dwarf. This is the cat's eye nebula, the white dwarf in the center. And that white dwarf is going to cool very slowly and for a very long time until it becomes a black dwarf. And there don't exist any black dwarfs yet because the universe isn't old enough. But in something like 10 to the 15 years, the sun will uh, no longer shine. It'll be a, a black rock in space. And for a unit conversion, that's a million billion years. So we have to remember that this axe will rust away and become oxide again. And like the sun, we all will die. Entropy will take its course. And cycles within cycles will slow. But before then, we can reach into the current and we can create an eddy, a temporary backward turning, and bring beauty into the world. Um, I, I want to thank a, a few people um, including Dave Beach um, for, for all the enthusiasm and, and mentorship and um, encouragement you give me throughout the whole project. Um, and, and Craig Milroy for, uh, this is a pretty wild, swirling, chaotic eddy here at the PRL um, and he, he manages it really well. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to, to do this without that. Um, thanks to Hideo for the uh, electron microscope images that we can look at later. Um, and, and a, a lot of other people, but I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm going to invite questions in, in, in a second, um, and then it'll, uh, after some time of that, just turn into a uh, sort of discussion. People can come up. Um, but, but also, I, um, I wanted to say that I really like doing this work, and, and I have ideas for expanding the project. I want to to make the crucible myself from ore that I, from like clay that I get from the ground. And um, I, I have ideas for ceramics projects where I could you know, understand local geology and make, make the pot. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm graduating now and, and 
uh, moving on to whatever's next. And I would love to try to do something like this. So if people have ideas of fellowships or grants or anything like that that, um, that they would recommend, I, I, would, I would love that. So um, I'll, I'll open it now uh, to any, any questions. Can you show the magnetite on the beach? Yeah. Is, this, is that all magnetite or is it mixed? It's, it's mixed. Um, so this is that magnetite. And this is a really big magnet. Um, and the stuff that's shaking out right now is not actually magnetic. Um, dad, that's my dad. He drove down from Oregon. Um, it's like six and a half hours. And he's going back tomorrow. <laughs> uh, there, it's, it's something like 60-40. There's 60% of this is magnetite. And the rest is titanium oxides. And there's a little bit of gold. People used to pan for gold on Ocean Beach. It's all the heavy stuff. Um, most of that's magnetite. And then, so 60% is magnetite, and 70% of that is iron. Yeah. These are fun. And with the, um, with the ingots, I did a magnetic separation. Um, where I, I put in just the, the magnetic portion um, for these ones. And this is an example of one of the ingots um, that uh, we cut in half and then turned into the axe. The, it, it's actually lucky, though, that crucible tilted. And so this was sort of a lopsided piece. So when we cut it in half, I got like a big chunk rather than an even smaller chunk. So um, that ingot or half of that ingot is this equals the axe? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was, it was two kilos of this magnetically separated sand to get one kilo of steel. Yeah, question? Uh, did you look into at all like, the discovery of smelting stuff? Like, was it just yeah. a bunch of guys sitting around a campfire throwing stuff in it? Or, like, um, they... Basically, yes, but <laughs> <laughs> over a long time. It, it started with probably ceramics, um, where people were glazing pots. And then there's often copper in those glazes. And so they probably noticed that the malachite that they're putting in their glazes, if it dripped off, might form these little nodules of pretty goldish stuff. And that's sort of where copper smelting came from, which is a lot lower temperature, a lot easier to do. Um, iron was, was actually present naturally, as was some copper um, in meteorites. And there's one other minor source, but um, Inuits used to have uh, lance points and, and knives that they made from meteorite iron. Um, but the, the smelting of iron itself, I'm actually sh not sure what that jump is from bronze to iron, but it, it was probably occurring when they were smelting bronze and happened to get some iron bearing materials really hot and noticed this weird thing. And then they had to build better furnaces and better crucibles and figure out ways to get more heat in there to actually get to iron. Um, this is a, a crucible steel, which is um, not how steel was, was always made. Um, for a long, long time, it was bloom steel, which is um, wrought iron, if, if people have heard that. So that's where you have a furnace, but it never quite gets hot enough to melt the iron and melt the steel. Um, it just sort of collects at the bottom in this spongy mass of plastic, gushy stuff. And then that's sort of mixed together with all the slag and all the glass that, for me, floated to the top. And what you have to do is you take that out when it's white hot, and you pound it, and you spray out all the, the gunk, and you compact it all into a single mass, and then draw it out and fold it and draw it out and fold it, trying to, to homogenize it and get the crap out. So that's you know, how the Japanese swords were made and, and how Viking swords were made. Um, 2,000 years ago, and that was... 1350 BC in Anatolia, present-day Turkey. Um, and then 2,000 years ago, um, they, they figured out crucible technology. A charcoal gets hot enough to make steel, no problem. It'll, it'll melt. If you're blacksmithing and you put your piece too far in for too long, it, it, you lose it. Um, but it's, it's a crucible that can, can withstand that and then contain the molten steel that's the problem. And so once they developed crucible technology in India, and areas around there, they were able to make crucible steels where they got it hot enough to actually melt. Um, and, and there are more modern processes, but sort of similar. 
uh, Nora. Oh, that was exciting. Um, well, the first smelt I did, which was with this ingot, and this is the first steel ever made on Stanford campus, right there. Um, this ingot was, uh, we, we put in broken beer bottles and um, calcium carbonate chalk for a flux because it needed a slag layer. And I thought, glass, calcium carbonate, um, sand dollars are made out of calcium carbonate, um, and that's where the chalk came from, actually. Um, not just sand dollars, but other marine organisms. So, um, and I know I'd seen them at, at, at Ocean Beach, so I, like 6 a.m. one morning, because I had to work or something, I drove out to Ocean Beach and skipped, missed traffic, luckily, and scooped up. I had like 10 minutes, and I just ran out onto the beach with a plastic bag um, and stuffed them until like I couldn't anymore and then ran home. Um, and and that was that was really cool. And it worked better than the than the the glass one. Actually, it was this really beautiful, um, glassy, pretty thing that formed on top. And there's some little bits that came out kind of cool. Um, so I made glass too, I guess. Is that anything like obsidian? Uh, I I guess so. Yeah, obsidian. Like this is this has so much calcium carbonate in it that's like very brittle and soft and has a lower melting temperature. I think obsidian, some other mix, much higher temperature. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, what's the percentage of carbon in your final axe? It's something like, um, where did I put it? Something like 0.8. Um, which is which is good for an axe. Um, it's it, it, that's determined by the temperature of the furnace, um, which is just uh, as carbon enters the axe enters the in solution, it lowers the melting temperature, and um, we were able to get to a certain temperature with the furnace. So carbon entered until it was able to melt, and then we turned off the furnace. And it, it just happens that that furnace design gets us where we need to be um, for an axe. So it had more to do with. Right. Yeah, it'll start scavenging charcoal or carbon from the crucible if, if there wasn't charcoal, um, and you just wait till it gets to the temperature, or wait till it melts, and that tells you it's the right carbon for the temperature you got. Um, this one is much higher, um, but yeah, I'll take a few more questions, and I'll just have people come up if they want. But maybe like questions for the group, uh, Matisse. What was the timeline of this project? I started the actual doing of it uh, this quarter, and I, I've been thinking about it and wanting to do it since early in the fall and sort of making contacts with Jeff. And um, I, last winter, I got the ore. I went like five times, and I was like, oh my god, I'm never going to find it. I was just at the wrong part of the beach, but when I finally found it, I, was, I, got five, I got nine gallons. I was like really greedy, and I was waddling, and I almost like broke my back with a five gallon. You'll see how heavy this is. It's um, heavy. Yeah. Philip, and then. So we've talked a lot about uh, kind of like looking forward into more natural methods of living hmm. uh, versus like, uh, or looking backwards into more natural methods of living and um, versus pushing into where we're going, technology and all those things, and you know, trying to balance those two or what, which one's more important. Uh, and I noticed this project knows really a lot about, uh, I'm getting right, it's a lot about looking back to um, how we can create something from the really basics instead of just going to the store and actually being connected to the process of how this is all actually made. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, I noticed like, as we went through it that you did have to make you know, allowances and water technology yeah. did enter in here. You had to use... Totally water, indispensable. You had to use a grinder to get those things off. So like, uh, did the fact that you had to use not driven technology at times to get to this point bother you at all? Or was that not really the point of the yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I want to do it completely from scratch, but Carl Sagan's right. I would have to first invent the universe. Um, and and in, in that sense, I think it's, it's more for me a process. It's, it's, I, I did this now, and I'm really excited now to make the crucible. 
rather than um, using a silicon carbide one. Um, and sort of step farther and farther back as I can, but it's not about getting anywhere because I'll never get anywhere. Um, doing this project, I, I, I know so much more about California and about you know, the sand on the beach and about the, the history of the universe. Like I, I didn't know that stuff before this. Um, and, and about the, the Sierras, and, and it just it gave me a, a reason to, to check out all these books <laughs> and, and, and go to these places and try to learn these things, and that was sort of the point of it. Um, that it's, it's sort of an entry point into what, what really matters, which for me is, is that connection and that understanding um, how things fit together. Yeah, Dave? I'm treading in probably dangerous and sensitive territory, especially the dead and the nights. But I claim the timeline started way longer than this quarter ago. Uh -huh. There's something about who you are and where you grew up and how you grew up that leads to be where you are now. And if you could share just a little of, I don't know, your childhood or, hmm. or special moments in the woods or special, I don't know what, you know, what informed Nick Winter? Oh, yeah. I, le I left that part out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you better go. Um, yeah, I knew that was dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, yeah. So, uh, I mean, he did in, in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I grew up in Southern Oregon, um, where, where I lived all my life, uh, in a pretty rural area, um, and with a lot of natural beauty on a lake, with a lot of wetlands close by. Um, there weren't any other kids in the neighborhood, really, just older ones, um, so I spent a lot of time, this is how I like to remember it, tell me if this is what actually happened. I spent a lot of time just like catching butterflies and lizards, right? Yeah. Um, I, I had fish traps and I kept fish in aquariums and um, uh, butterfly collections and, and just sort of was out alone or with my dad um, doing this stuff and, and that, that sort of got me interested in these things. And, and both my mom and my dad um, have done a lot of environmental, uh, they, they were both uh, wildlife ecologists was your degree, right? What was your, you were a wildlife, wildlife ecologist and, and that's where my parents met. My dad's now orthopedic surgeon, but they do a lot of work in, in conservation and um, restoring wetlands in our area. So that, that connection to an interest in the, just like the natural world was, was always strong for me. Um, in high school, I, I did a, a thing with my dad called a kinetic sculpture. Um, it was a kinetic sculpture race, and that was making a human-powered all-terrain vehicle. Um, and there was this race that came to our kind of podunk town, and this kind of, kind of weird thing where it's sort of a very big parade, and, and it's, you build this thing, and you have to go through land and sand and water, and it's all human-powered. Um, but it's you also bribe the judges and wear crazy costumes and we were vikings with a viking ship and i, I spent all of the last two years of high school in the shop with my dad and and with my friends um, like friday night there was one night when my dad came in and he said i was like threading i was putting threads on some rods with my friend jake and he's like shouldn't you guys be out drinking or something <laughs> I can answer that question for you. He just had it. He just, he just, he had opportunity because of where he grew up, but he just had it in him. He had this kinetic sculpture thing. He didn't have to do that. I didn't believe him. He did it. So it just sort of came out who he was. We just gave him opportunities. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, and then it was earth science undergrad following those first interests and loves and then coming back. I took ME203 um, senior year and, and that was like a homecoming for me of like, oh my God, I remember this from, from high school. And it was um, really something I wanted, that concrete creativity. Um, and then took time off and, and then came back for this, so. I thought I'd get a glimpse of who you were through your ME203 project. Hmm. So you did forming, you did raising welding, you did casting, and you did a thing to make better bread. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> just, in some ways, for me, that's still iconic, hmm. who you are. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, thank you all for coming. I, I really appreciate the chance to share all this. It's, it's been uh, a long, exciting process for me, and it feels really good to, it feels like a culmination, and, and I, I'm grateful that I got to do that. This is another axe I made, but it <laughs> not out of steel, not out of this steel. Uh, you can have the rock. <laughs> <laughs>